Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like we've got hmm, close to 300 folks in here now, so we will go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jill Jacobs. I'm the Commissioner of the Administration on Disabilities. I will describe myself briefly. I am a middle-aged white lady with brown hair pulled back today. I'm wearing glasses with red frames, a brown sweater, and a, I don't know, a tan top. And I'm in my office um, today in D.C., and behind me is an American flag and another flag. I always forget what it is. I think it's HHS. I should have to figure that out sometime, but it, that one is blue and yellow. Um, so we're going to talk today a little bit about, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about home and community-based services. This is the fifth in the Administration on Community Living, Living's webinar series on the role of stakeholders, all of you, in ensuring high quality in home and community-based services. So in this session, we are going to dive into the Medicaid waiver application. And by that, we mean the state Medicaid waiver application. And we're gonna focus on uh, the section related to participant rights. So a little bit of logistics. Um, participants will be muted during this webinar. You can use the chat feature in, this, in Zoom to post questions and communicate with the hosts. Um, the chat window's there at the bottom. Um, toward the end of the webinar, our speakers will have an opportunity to respond to questions um, that have been entered into the chat. Um, the, the webinar will be captioned, uh, live captioned in English. Uh, live English captions can be accessed by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you hover your mouse over the CC button, there's a little up carrot, you press that up arrow, and um, you can click on caption or you can click on full uh, caption. This uh, live webinar includes an evaluation poll at the end of the session. So if you hang on to the end, there will be a very, very brief, it's not going to take a long time, um, evaluation. And we appreciate if you fill that out because it helps us do better. Um, you know, each time we get an evaluation, we know what we need to do uh, to be better next time. So our agenda today, um, the Medicaid waiver application, um, an overview of the Medi state Medicaid waiver application, uh, participant rights, which is Appendix F of the application, the question and answer session, and closing comments and an evaluation poll. Uh, next, we, we will, oops, sorry about that. So next we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk about why the waiver application is important. Um, States describe who and how many people they will serve in their waiver, waiver application. So when they, um, can you do the next slide, please? Thank you. So when a state applies for, um, for uh, to, to do their, their waiver, they have to describe to CMS who and how many people they're going to serve in that waiver, what services they will provide and how much, what protections are in place, whether people can self-direct and family members can be paid, how they will follow the home and community-based services rule. And when CMS approves the application, the state must implement it as approved. Um, only what is in the waiver can be provided. So states can't say we want to provide something that doesn't exist. And now I will turn it over to, I think, Nancy. Um, put my video on. Hi, everybody. Um, Aaron, would you like to walk through some of the other points uh, on the slide before we get going? Uh, did you mean, did you want me to do everybody's bios and everything? Oh, and the logistics, yeah, before oh. I launch into this. Yeah. Uh, well, Jill ran over the logistics okay. um, about, you know, Right. Put your comments in the chat, and hopefully we'll have a Q&A session at the end where we'll be able to get to some of your comments. Um, so let me just introduce all of our speakers Good. for today. Um, first, we have Nancy Thaler, uh, who you just saw on camera. Um, following eight years working as a community provider developing community services for children and adults with intellectual disabilities, Ms. Thaler joined Pennsylvania State Government in 1987 and served as the Deputy Secretary for the Office of Developmental Programs from 1993 to 2003. Ms. Thaler served as the Director of Quality Improvement for the 
HHS Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services from 2003 to 2006, and was responsible for developing the state application for the 1915C HCBS waiver programs. Ms. Thaler was appointed Executive Director of the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disabilities Services in 2007, serving in that role until 2015, when she returned to serve as Pennsylvania's Deputy Secretary of the Office of Developmental Programs until 2018. Ms. Thaler is currently Senior Policy Advisor to the Administration for Community Living. She has a Bachelor of Arts and an Honorary Doctorate from College Misericordia and a Master's of Human Organization Science and Public Administration from Villanova University. Ms. Thaler and her husband are the parents of an adult son with developmental disabilities. Next, I'd like to introduce Jill Jacobs, uh, who was speaking earlier in this webinar. Um, Jill was appointed to serve as the Commissioner of ACL's Administration on Disabilities on February 14th, 2022. Ms. Jacobs has more than two decades of professional experience managing disability services organizations, analyzing policy, and working towards improved health and disability programs and services at the local, state, and federal levels. She also has been an active grassroots organizer, leading campaigns to depict Pre President Franklin D. Roosevelt seated in his wheelchair in the National Monument in Washington, D.C., and to ensure the inclusion of disabled children in schools and organizing disaster response efforts for people with disabilities following Hurricanes Harvey and Maria, just to name a few of her accomplishments. In addition, Ms. Jacobs brings to the role her lived experience of her own disability and as the mother of two disabled adults. Next, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Edwards. Elizabeth Edwards is a senior attorney in the National Health Law Program's North Carolina offices. In addition to working with the National Health Law Program's litigation team to advance the health rights of low-income and underserved individuals, her work includes policy advocacy and legal education. Ms. Edwards joined the National Health Law Program after five years with Disability Rights North Carolina, where she used the Medicaid Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and public policy to ensure equal access and community integration for individuals and groups, along with other ADA issues such as voting rights and accessibility. A graduate of the law school at UNC Chapel Hill, she obtained her bachelor's in environmental science and public policy from Duke University. Despite the law degree, she remains an ardent Duke fan. <laughs> Ms. Edwards is from rural North Carolina and often returns to play in the country or at least get out to the area greenways and parks. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Prio, Senior Disability Legal Specialist at the National Disability Rights Network. Elizabeth Prio provides assistance to PNAs related to community integration with a focus on Medicaid litigation and the implementation of the Olmstead versus LC Supreme Court decision. Additionally, she is responsible for the NDRN initiative to support and encourage PNA advocacy on behalf of older adults with disabilities. Ms. Prio began working formally as a disability advocate in 1986 at United Cerebral Palsy Associations and also worked as a researcher at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. She has served as vice chair on the board of directors of both the Independent Center of Northern Virginia and the Virginia Office for Protection and Advocacy. She received a BA from Emory University and a JD from the Washington College of Law at American University in Washington, D.C. Those are our speakers for today, and I'm going to turn it back over to Nancy Thaler. Okay, thank you, Erin, and um, we'll get started here. Um, you didn't won't hear um, Jill's voice much, but Jill is always on these calls and introduces them because she's really the one behind all the efforts to um, increase stakeholder engagement, the webinars, much of the work that our national network is doing, and um, as you know from her resume, this is pretty close to her heart. So going to um, the uh, waiver application, um, we have what would, great, looking at what we have up. So this is, I think, number five in our series. Um, as we walk through the waiver application so people understand um, what it is and how to use it to get your needs met, as the title says. Um, and uh, just to be clear um, that, um, keep going, uh, Next slide, right. Um, this is about explicitly the 1915C waiver applications that we know as home and community-based services. But there are other ones. There, um, some states have a 19, 
1115 waiver. That's a just sort of a global waiver. Um, there's 1915I, 1915J. So there are other home acute based services, some of which mirror the HCBS uh, number uh, letter C authority. Um, but when we show you displays of it, it is explicitly uh, the 1915C. Next slide. So this is F. This is the slide we always use to show all of the appendices. This waiver application is really a document that's made up predominantly of appendices, each for a specific area. We skipped A and B. They are they're very um, uh, they're about the bureaucracy, how a state runs its bureaucracy, and eligibility is fairly complex. Um, uh, a lot of options that states have to pick, but we did one on participant services, person-centered planning, persistent direction, and now we're at participant rights. And for this one, I really asked for two guest speakers to do this because, um, next slide, um, because this app set of the app, uh, this appendix in the application only has one thing that's required. It's, it's every state in Medicaid statute has to have a fair hearing and um, provide notice to people of their right to fair hearing, which means typically going in front of someone who serves in a hearing officer role, it's fairly formal. So what states do to make the system a little more user-friendly is have sometimes they have dispute resolution processes um, and they also have grievance systems. Not all states have both. I think rarely do states have both. Um, neither of these two are required by CMS, nor are they required by the state of the participant. That is, everyone always has the right to go right to fair hearing. Um, there are not a lot of federal standards for di dispute resolution or grievance complaint because, again, it was inserted into the waiver application as um, a good idea, an option, and asking states to describe it. For those of you that are know about the fact that CMS just issued um, something called the access rule for comment, uh, and they're soliciting comments. One of the things in that access rule is a new requirement for states to have a grievance procedure. So um, because so much of this um, part of the waiver application is discretionary, um, we brought two experts on uh, who have been working in the field, whose introductions you've heard, and they're going to walk through um, these sections of the waiver application with, um, I would say, advisories and thoughts for how you might advocate for these things in your state. So I'm going to hand it first to uh, Elizabeth Prio, and um, who is going to take the next slide. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Prio. I want to start out by saying uh, that I am a white woman with glasses, uh, middle age. And um, I also wanted to, because it didn't explain much in my bio, I wanted to let you know that the way I uh, attain this experience is by working at the National Disability Rights Network. It's uh, the uh, association for the federally funded protection and advocacy agencies. And the PNAs are, uh, are receive funding from the federal government to provide legal assistance to people with disabilities who have been discriminated against on the basis of disability, and primarily when it comes to abuse and neglect in institutions or the community and uh, failure of the government to provide services under programs like Medicaid and other federal programs. And the reason I think it's important to say that is if you haven't heard of the Protection and Advocacy Agency, there is one in every state and territory. And if you are having legal issues like this, you are welcome to call them. They do have priority areas. They're not able to take every area that somebody calls into. So just be aware of that. Okay, so on to uh, this, the, um, Nancy already explained uh, what, what Appendix F is. I wanna provide a little bit more background on why we need participant rights so badly and why the Medicaid Act provides for this. It's because uh, in uh, the Medicaid Act, the 
the Congress was very clear. They mandated certain services that had to be provided and certain services that were optional for the states to take on. But what they didn't do is talk about what is the minimum level of, of these required services. Instead, they left it up to the state and they gave them certain guidelines. They said, you know, the states, you're required to provide reasonable standards uh, that are comparable for all disability groups. And then by regulation, they took a stab at trying to provide a little more information about what reasonable standards are. And they said, you know, reasonable standards have to uh, provide uh, enough services in sufficient amount, duration, and scope to achieve their purpose. They also said that services had to be provided with reasonable promptness comparable to other uh, groups. So the reason I go through this I, is not because, well, I think that you already received some information about this when you uh, were on the earlier webinar about Medicaid services, but it bears repeating because it, it explains why the Medicaid Act offers uh, an, an automatic right to a fair hearing. And that's because there is always gonna be tension between the provider who uh, maybe has a financial incentive or another type of incentive to deny services and you, the individual with the, who needs the services. And so uh, that is why fair hearings are so important. And uh, now I'll get into um, to what we mean by this. As Nancy said, whether you're in fee-for-service or managed care, you have a right to a fair hearing. It's actually a constitutional right, and it cannot be waived uh, just by um, um, a, a state law, for example. Um, then you also have an optional right for dispute resolution and a grievance complaint system. And Elizabeth Edwards, who will speak after me, is gonna go into more detail about what those programs are. But uh, it's important to note that this is optional because uh, you as an advocate are gonna be looking for ways, which when you review a waiver, you can encourage the state to do things like uh, require and uh, provide a dispute resolution or a grievance complaint system. And there are pros and cons to each. But uh, next slide, please. So um, again, we wanna say that there are different requirements for managed care and for fee-for-service. We're primarily focusing on fee-for-service, which basically says you, you have to have a state fair hearing uh, ability. Um, in managed care plans, like uh, Nancy was saying, there were regulations that were published and they provide uh, more specifics on what managed care plans have to provide. And in that circumstance, uh, a grievance and a requirement to go through an informal appeal is required. And there are pros and cons to that for sure. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so this is what it's going to look like on the waiver. So uh, this is just uh, offered so you can see that it's easy to miss this section and uh, that it's important to read these small print. Okay, go ahead to slide 12. Um, so what are the fair hearing triggers? So that, in other words, when can a participant request a fair hearing? And that's when services are denied, suspended, reduced, or terminated. So the good thing is that's pretty darn broad, denied, suspended, reduced, or terminated. Uh, we are not talking about uh, uh, eligibility here, we we're specifically talking about services for individuals who have already been found eligible. Um, so uh, this includes termination from a waiver. And if the waiver is, uh, you know, self-directed services, that can include termination uh, from um, involuntary termination of self-directed services. The reason that we put it here is because um, there has been cases that have challenged and said, you know, I've been, uh, my services have been suspended or reduced, and this meant that I cannot uh, follow the self-directed services that I need 
And uh, that is not always going to be found as something that can, uh, can trigger a fair hearing. So just be aware of that. And um, what you are also gonna be able to request a fair hearing for, in addition to services denied, suspended, reduced, or terminated, is the services that are not provided with reasonable promptness. And uh, we'll go into uh, a little bit more about that, but basically that uh, you can make the argument of um, what services, it's, it's basically 90 days, but you can also make the argument in court about what uh, is reasonable for your needs um, and why you're at the hearing. So um, another thing that the triggers a fair hearing is if the state was not providing a choice of home and community-based services as an alternative to institutional care. That was actually written right into uh, the, uh, the uh, participant rights section. So um, that, is, that is key and is something that you might not have realized that states are required to do. Um, so, and that it's also denying an individual the services or choice of provider of their choice. Now, this is a, a has a, a few caveats. It's also called any willing provider. Uh, this is sometimes how people refer to this provider of their choice. So they have to be a provider approved by Medicaid, and they have to be willing to provide you the service. So, um, so it's not that you can just take any provider and they have to, and they have to offer it. So again, um, also services denied, suspended, reduced, or terminated. Uh, the other thing that can trigger a fair hearing and something you should know about fair hearing requirements are that they have timelines for when you have to request a fair hearing, when you have, when you can request an expedited fair hearing. Um, there are other very good things, like you uh, have the ability to review your full case file prior to the hearing. So you can't just be given information the day you walk in. Um, and the information provided to you during the hearing has to be in your language of choice and accessible to the needs of, of people with disabilities. So. Uh, an interpreter provided, um, that you can't be required to go to a hearing in an inaccessible location, uh, that if they say the hearing must be provided uh, virtually, if you think that a virtual hearing is going to be uh, disadvantage you as a result of your disability, you have a uh, the right to request that the hearing be available in person uh, or vice versa. If you really need a uh, hearing virtually, um, that, that could be considered a reasonable modification to ensure accessibility. Um, you also have a right to an expedited review. So um, an expedited review would mean uh, you have to show and prove that, uh, that if you weren't able to get a hearing faster than say the three months out that they're requesting, um, that it would disadvantage your health, your um, your life, and or it would lead to a reduction in your uh, in your ability. Um, let's see, I want to get it exactly right. Your health, your life, and um, it, it would lead to a reduction in your functioning. So, uh, next slide, please. So uh, here are the criteria for the fair hearing. Um, when, an, when an individual first becomes, gets onto the waiver, the, the waiver notice must tell people that they are have a right to a fair hearing process if services are denied, reduced, terminated, or not provided with reasonable promise. That, that doesn't mean that's the only time they have to inform them of their rights. Once a service is denied, reduced, or suspended, they have to again notify you of your right to a fair hearing. And there are specific requirements of what the notice uh, must provide. 
And this is an area where states that states notoriously violate. So uh, you should know this and uh, you might want to, as an advocate, as the waiver is being developed, say, suggest that maybe there is a template for uh, a for a notice um, so that that you can ensure that it really meets these requirements. Okay, so the the um, the notice must uh, include uh, how it will be provided so over over the phone, mail, that sort of thing. Uh, it can't be provided over the phone. Sorry, um, the uh, the entities or entity that's responsible for issuing the notice and the assistance, if any that will be provided to the individual that's pursuing the fair hearing. So again, we talked about how it had to be in the language of your a choice and um, had to reasonable accommodations have to be made. So next slide, please. Um, here's Mark. I, I think I already mentioned what's called a paid pending, but in general, you have, uh, you know, a reasonable time period after you're notified that the service is is, is denied, you are re, uh, they are required to give you a reasonable time period to request a hearing. However, if you want to make sure that the services will continue during the period that your case is appealed, uh, you must request within ten days of the notice that you received. Uh, for, for what's called continued benefits or aid paid pending. And uh, there are some circumstances where this is not required, uh, which basically goes also to um, uh, one of the things that I mentioned about your, forgot to mention about your right to a fair hearing is you don't have a right to a fair hearing if the denial is a result of a change in federal or state law. So, uh, so um, that would be, you know, that the, the federal laws or the state says we are no longer providing this service to this group of individuals with disabilities. If it's the entire group and it's a change in the statute, you would not be able to go to a fair hearing for that. However, if you believe that um, you don't, uh, you know, you are not in that, uh, that group, for example, that uh, was, in, in the statute, you could appeal for that, but hopefully you will understand the difference. And regarding aid paid pending, again, you have to request it within 10 days of uh, receiving the notice. Um, however, one of the reasons why it's so important to know the requirements of the notice or to go to an attorney is that um, if, if you find that the notice was inadequate, and didn't provide all the things required, uh, then you can still perhaps uh, have a chance to request continued benefits. Okay, um, and uh, they must specify where the notices of adverse actions are kept and, and uh, the opportunity to request a fair hearing is, is kept. Um, could you go back to slide 13? I don't think I properly reviewed uh, what I meant to say about their requirements for the fair hearing. So is it possible to go back to slide? Okay. Um, so, uh, well, actually, um, uh, maybe uh, that is gonna be gone over in another area by Elizabeth. But um, what I wanted to say is uh, one of the things that's key is the state has to give you at least 10 days advance notice before they reduce or terminate the service that uh, you've requested. So that is key as far as um, this requirement that you have to, if you want to request to continue benefits, you have 10 days. So they have to give you 10 days before they terminate the benefits and you have to request for the uh, benefits to continue within those 10 days. And the notice has to make clear that you have a right to request a hearing and for continued benefit. So I'm going to now uh, turn it over to Elizabeth Edwards 
to talk about some of the ways which these requirements are not met and some of the opportunities for advocacy. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so I see some questions in the chat or, or in the Q&A already about sort of differences between fair hearing and grievances and appeals. And hopefully um, this section will help us figure out or parse out where all of those uh, different procedures lie, but it is very confusing, especially if your state has managed care. So I just wanted to quickly go over some of the things that are missing when in the 1915C waiver application and the review process, when we're talking about what does the state have to tell CMS? Um, so sometimes there's a lot of interplay between you know, what a state has on paper about promising to offer a fair hearings and due process when a service is terminated, reduced, or denied. Um, but actually what happens around requests for services and denials of services, especially in the person-centered planning process, can really impact uh, access to a hearing. So for example, um, what a person may be offered, right? Like what are you told about what you can and cannot request? in terms of services during the person-centered planning process, sometimes that process can actually function to deny a person without necessarily allowing them to realize they have been denied. And we'll talk about a little of some of those examples in a few minutes. Um, also, this is commonly, uh, commonly occurs when states use budgeting processes where they assign a person a, a, a budget based on an assessment of need. And then they may, you know, discourage people from asking for services based on some strict interpretations of budgeting. And so sometimes when um, a state has in their waiver process, yes, we offer uh, due process and notice and right to a fair hearing in section F, it seems very um, kind of basic in a lot of ways and doesn't really capture some of these areas in which um, there may be problems with how a person accesses services. And this is an area where there's an opportunity for advocacy to sort of really force the state to lay out what protections are in place for people when they are requesting services in the person-centered planning process, when they are denied services, and what does that look like and how uh, are notice and due process rights triggered in some of those processes. Similarly, um, we I refer to this as discouragement, but it doesn't really, the waiver application doesn't require a state to say, how are we protecting against discouragement? And by discouragement, I mean some of those same features about like, oh, you can only request X amount of services, regardless if you think you need more, or um, only, a require, only request this because that's what we'll approve, or some other um, different ways in which people are discouraged from asking for services can sometimes be a violation of notice and um, fair hearing rights. And if a state, if a advocates can help push a state to include some protections against discouragement in the waiver application in these sections, it can really be helpful when uh, people are trying to raise their hand and say something is wrong. Um, also, there is requirement in the section F1 to talk about what education is provided to individuals in terms of, you know, when and how a person is informed of their fair hearing rights. But this doesn't necessarily provide a lot of information about how a person is to understand those hearing, fair hearing rights. Um, it can be pretty complicated. It seems fairly straightforward to say, oh, you just have a right to a fair hearing when your services have been denied. But what does that denial look like? And when do you go to these other um, processes of grievances and complaints versus when you go to a fair hearing and some of the different examples of when it is a fair hearing versus when it is a grievance or complaint. So there could be more information in the waiver to sort of set those things out so there's more clarity and to make sure that people have more education and that there's education at the time of um, a fair hearing right is triggered. Uh, also assistance to individuals in the waiver application and the review of the application by CMS, it says um, assistance to individuals, if any, is provided. But in, um, in every state, there are legal services and there is a protection and advocacy system. And they may not always be able to provide services, but it is technically available as a resource for people. And I think arguably should be included, their information should be included in, um, in, a, in the uh, application about, you know, when is, what type of information is a person provided? Um, 
in the fair hearing process. So those are just some things that I would say there's room for advocacy in uh, the application process when a waiver is up for a new waiver or when one is up for an amendment. Next slide, please. So uh, Elizabeth were largely, Elizabeth Prio largely went over the fair hearing process. And so next we're going to talk about Appendix F2, which is where there is the additional dispute resolution processes. And I will admit this is where it gets a little bit confusing, especially between F2 and F3, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, as Elizabeth Prio mentioned earlier, Appendix F1 about the fair hearing process is a required section. Um, it's uh, but F2, which is about additional dispute resolution processes, is optional. So some states operate an additional dispute resolution process outside of their fair hearing process. Um, it's important to know that this process cannot be required to be used by an individual as a prerequisite to the fair hearing process or to operate in place of it. And we'll go over a few of those requirements in just a minute. Uh, but this on the slide is just the section of the waiver that you would see and how the state has filled it out in your particular waiver. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, what you would see in the waiver on an additional dispute resolution process is how the state defines the dispute mechanism and how it describes um, what type of disputes can be addressed, including any processes and timelines. Um, and it has to be clear in the section that it cannot replace a fair hearing, basically, or force a person to go through this process before a fair hearing. And I did want to note, um, as Elizabeth Prio mentioned earlier, that when you're in managed care, you are required to do the informal appeal process to the managed care entity. Um, but that is uh, different from this process, although a state may describe that process in this section of the waiver. And I know that's kind of confusing, but hopefully during the Q&A, which we've reserved time for, we can explain that a little bit better. But basically, if you're in fee-for-service for your waiver services, um, you would go straight, you can go straight to a fair hearing, and this can never, um, this dispute resolution process cannot impede it. Under managed care, um, if the state uses the managed care grievance process as part of its dispute resolution process, you may have to go through the informal, that kind of informal hearing before you get to a fair hearing. If, I hope that makes sense, but we can answer more questions later. So next slide. Uh, sorry, I forgot I actually had a slide set for this. Um, but as I said, similar names can really create confusion because a managed care, under the managed care regulations, it is called a grievance. Um, and you would often hear that term uh, from a state's alternative dispute resolution process as well. So we'll try to parse that out a little bit later. Next slide. Uh, so to make things even more confusing, if we're not confused enough yet, uh, Appendix F3 allows a state to identify an additional state grievance or complaint system. Now the trick here is that what this part of the waiver is really supposed to cover is more issues with a person being dissatisfied with their services or um, seek resolution of problems and issues with services that are the, either being received or that have been authorized. Um, typically, this type of state grievance or complaint system under F3 is more about sort of satisfaction with services as opposed to getting or not getting a uh, service that you want or have already been approved for. So this could be issues with providers or, um, you know, a person sort of being dissatisfied with their experience or not being treated well by a provider or um, maybe even your, your care manager, that type of thing. This is where that type of grievance or complaint would go rather than, um, as Elizabeth Prio explained, like a fair hearing is more about when your right, your services are denied or terminated. So another, again, this is a, another optional thing for a state to fill out. Um, and again, it's still not supposed to undermine access to fair hearing. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the things that is important here is that sometimes these are more local or provider-based complaint systems, um, but the state is still supposed to describe if they have this type of process, um, the types of complaints that can be addressed, the processes and the timelines, and again, that um, it can't be used to limit access to the right to fair hearing. And like I said, these are much more supposed to be um, satisfaction type complaints or issues with how services are provided as opposed to whether services are provided or not. 
And then next slide, please. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time walking through a North Carolina example that hopefully will sort of just give you more information about what this looks like in practice and also some of the um, ways in which a person's can be discouraged from services that can should be triggering the fair hearing process as opposed to triggering either the complaint process or the alternative dispute resolution process. So um, several years ago, probably um, almost 10 years ago at this point, um, a lawsuit was brought in North Carolina around the in, waiver for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, in North Carolina at the time, there this waiver was operated um, under a concurrent 1915B waiver, so it was operated by a managed care plan, and these managed care plans were regional in North Carolina. Um, and what happened was um, people, the, the managed care plan started using a new budgeting tool um, that was based off of a SIS or supports intensity set scale assessment. And then the, they would run it through a matrix and it would assign people to different budget areas. Um, and they did this mid plan year um, and they sent a bunch of notices that said, you are now in a new budget, you must comply and didn't include appeal rights. So that was sort of the basis of the case, but the purpose in bringing this up is the settlement to this case uh, led to some changes in how North Carolina operated um, the person-centered planning process to provide greater protection for uh, due process rights. So new uh, notices were issued, the different you know, various changes were made, but one important piece was this uh, communication bulletin to managed care plans and to um, providers, or not to providers, to uh, care coordinators or case managers. So next slide. So as I said, it was uh, based on the new use of the supports intensity scale. Um, and one of the biggest issues was that, or one of the biggest things that was resolved is that it must be clear to families that they can request the services they need, not have to stay strictly within assigned budgets. Um, and that no discouragement of asking for a service was allowed. Um, and we provided, part of the settlement was this bulletin that provided sample language, which I'll go over some examples next, which I think will help clarify things in the next slide. There we go. So um, part of this multi-page bulletin was that um, a denial or a partial denial could not be based on rationales such as the assigned budget would typically meet the needs of someone with similar support needs, or that um, it was determined that the person's name is not an outlier to his assigned category, or that documentation shows needs consistent with the assigned budget category. This type of language was considered not specific enough and discouraging to requesting services. Uh, compare it to the next slide, where uh, the denial, denial or partial denial could be based on more specific language about information and assessments provided do not justify an increase in the service hours, or the information provided does not indicate that the individual would benefit from the co combination of service hours requested. Um, I know that these are kind of, they don't seem like significant changes um, or differences, but they really did make a difference in how people were able to uh, feel like they could ask for services and how care managers or care coordinators were sort of not holding people explicitly to the budgets. Um, and this is sort of this difference between straight out denials of services versus language that discourages people from asking for services. And for advocates, um, it can be helpful to be clear that all of anything that's discouraging to people uh, requesting services may rise to the level of a due process right that should trigger a right to a fair hearing, as opposed to a right to or as opposed to sending the person to the dispute resolution process or a grievance. So for example, um, if a person's being told stay within this budget and you can't ask for more services, that should likely be treated as a right to a fair hearing, as opposed to uh, if you wanna complain about that, somebody's like, oh no, that's just a grievance about how your care manager treats you. That's that shouldn't be happening. Um, and that's something that you could 
try to make clear in Appendix F1 versus Appendix F2 and 3 and a waiver, right? So what is going to trigger grievances and complaints about how you're being treated versus the services that you're either being provided or um, you're not being allowed to ask for uh, in terms of denial. Similarly, um, if a person during the person-centered planning process is not really being given the full array of options about how they could, what services they could request under the waiver, um, that might also trigger the fair hearing rights as opposed to uh, grievances or dispute resolution because that's something they should be uh, allowed to have access to and allowed to request, uh, even if they may be denied because it's determined they are not eligible for it based on service definitions. So hopefully that it helps explain a little bit the difference between um, fair hearing and rights to services and when you may be, when a discouragement of a service or somebody telling you shouldn't ask for something should rise to the level of fair hearing versus you are complaining about how you're being treated in the person-centered planning process or treated in the um, in a service, more than that might be more of a dispute resolution or a grievance. Um, I think that is confusing still, but hopefully it gives an example of um, a sort of real world, real world solution to um, just to sort of setting forth what is um, the differences between the different things. And I would flag on the next slide um, that in the North Carolina Innov Innovations Waiver, which is the waiver this settlement originally applied to, um, it does not explain all of this. But the, I think the advocacy point here is that it could, right? It could describe how the state promises not to discourage people in the waiver from requesting services and what rises to the level of fair hearing rights versus what rises to the, what is just going to be treated as a grievance um, through the managed care plan. So uh, in F3 in North Carolina, they really talk more about grievances being more about abuse, neglect, and exploitation and access to services and administrative issues and quality of care type of issues uh, versus what they have under fair hearing, which is much more clear about service denials and terminations. Um, but I think for our purposes in this webinar, in terms of how can we advocate for um, waiver documents themselves to really reflect the protections a person should have, I think it could be in F1, they could be much more clear about when a person has a right to hearing and what does discouragement look like, as opposed to it being in F2 and F3, about what does that kind of grievance system look like in terms of complaint about services. So I think I'm uh, passing it back over to Nancy now, and we can take questions at the end. I see there's a bunch of questions. Um. Yes, thank you to both of us. And um, one, I think this might be our highest number of participants in a webinar, and without a doubt, the highest number of questions. Um, clearly, um, this webinar hits a nerve. Um, Elizabeth and Elizabeth, can you both see the questions that have come up? And are there any, um, some of them are not specific to federal policy, but may fall in um, the advocacy realm. Um, so are there any that you, you'd like to speak to? And as you're looking at them, um, I want to say that um, uh, who can you get to help you? Um, there is in every state on an ombudsman office, a long-term care ombudsman uh, that can help particularly with people using any waivers that, are, uh, that involve assisted living and home and community-based services. Um, as Elizabeth Prio explained, uh, the PNAs, there is a PNA that our agency administration of community living funds in every state um, that's available for consultation and support. Um, and then, you know, we hope that when people are enrolled in the Medicaid waiver and ha have a case manager, that their case manager can um, either assist or help track them to um, someone who can uh, give it good advice and sort through these issues. Um, so, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, are there any of these questions? And I believe there are a number of ACL staff on the call. So, um, and we can try to respond to as many of these as possible. 
So Elizabeth, so, Elizabeth, anyone you want to take? Yeah, I see one about um, when uh, an appeal or fair hearing is won by families or a person, they are then voided by the commissioner of DHS. So then the family is sort of back at square one. Um, and what is the remedy there? This has been addressed by advocates in at least two states by um, the state actually making the Office of Fair Hearings the, the, the one who makes the final agency decision. So often in states, um, the Office of Fair Hearings is just making a recommended decision and the state does the final agency decision. So at least in two states that I know of, it might be more now, the um, the state has delegated the final agency decision to the Office of Fair Hearings or whatever the office is named of that does the fair hearing decision. The other sort of potential remedy for this, and it's, it's very dependent on states, and so we can't provide any type of specific legal advice here today, but um, usually there's a mechanism to appeal um, a final agency decision that goes so far against what the recommended decision was, and the standards for that differ wildly by states, but oftentimes there is should be an appeal mechanism um, that can sometimes help the um, advocacy, advocacy community uh, make sure the state is more closely adhering to when it can and cannot veer uh, uh, greatly away from uh, a recommended decision. And like I said, that varies by state, so it, it really depends. But I would say that one advocacy option is to, you know, try to push for the state to, to delegate the fair hearing decision, the final agency decision. Um, Elizabeth, while you're on, there's a question um, early on about the right to fair hearing and whether or not there's a requirement to have an intermediary activity. Um, and you address this, but uh, to address this question, um, managed care is different, right? And right. do you want to talk about what managed care, why managed care is different and what is allowed? Yeah, so managed care just operates under a different set of regulations. Um, they, they do generally have to follow other ones as well, but especially for fair hearings and grievances and appeals, they have a different set of regulations under 42 CFR 438 400 um, that it's, it describes a, a, a action differently. And it also describes that um, a person has to first go through the informal appeal hearing with the managed care entity before they have access to a state fair hearing. It, it's just a rule. I cannot tell you why. It just is something that is required. Um, it's a more recent change in the last couple of years that it is required to go through that informal process. So really it's under managed care that you have to go through that. If you don't have managed care, um, there shouldn't be uh, things in the way of access to fair hearing. Um, some states might have like optional uh, mediation or something like that, but it should still be optional in that instance, unless we're talking about managed care. Um, several of you have asked, will the slides be available? Yes, they will be. Um, Aaron, uh, who hosted us here, uh, will have them posted to our website and um, possibly uh, be able to insert the, the link in the chat. Um, there is a question here, which I think was addressed, but I want to make sure. If services are reduced, can they be frozen during the appeal or fair hearing process so that people can keep their current level of services pending outcome? Um, and so I'm, I'm going to ask Elizabeth or Elizabeth, but Elizabeth Edwards, what has, I, I, th I think I know the answer to this, but you have the experience across a number of states of what, about what's really going on. So why don't you take that one? Well, actually, I'll pass it to Elizabeth Prio because she covered it in her section, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, um, I uh, want to, you know, I typed in a full answer to that and pressed send, and I don't know where the response went. <laughs> I responded to three questions here, and I don't see my responses, which is annoying. But um, that is basically, you have a right to, um, to well, while the uh, appeal is going on, and before the Determ the determinate the decision, you have a right to request continued benefits. Um, the catch is that you don't have very long to do so. I think I mentioned that uh, you have the provider has to give you notice 10 days prior to reducing uh, or otherwise changing your services. And in those 10 days, you are allowed to request for continued benefits. 
Um, you're also allowed to request expedited hearing if you believe that the hearing is set for three months away and this could uh, you know, harm your life, your health, or uh, your functioning. Uh, so those are two things that you can uh, get while you're uh, provided. But um, it's important to note that you may have to uh, reimburse the state for some of the services you received during the uh, pending the appeal if you lose. So oftentimes states will make a big deal about this and you know it's part of the discouragement that Elizabeth Edwards was just mentioning. Right. There have been a number of questions about managed care. Um, it all, all along the same lines about the uh, requirement to file a grievance. And um, I, uh, what I would say to that um, and to the purpose of all of our webinars is that um, state waiver programs are optional and the states have incredible latitude to design how they operate them. And um, and CMS has no standing to require, there are many, many things CMS has no standing to require, like it cannot require states to pay family members of family caregivers, for instance, which has been a, a, a question up here a number of times. So advocacy at the state level is enormously important because the states, as I said, have the discretion to design them the way they want within the rules. Um, and remember, states are paying for anywhere from 25 to 50 percent of this. So that's what makes it a state program. So as these Medicaid waivers are being developed and renewed every five years, including the 1115, this is the opportunity for advocates to speak with one and strong voice to, um, to, to influence how it's designed and what the requirements are. Um, so that's true about um, the state has the latitude to require a, a grievance process through the MCO before going to fair hearings and appeals, how that's conducted, how that's designed, or whether it's even required um, very much depends on what goes on between the advocacy community and the state. Because as I said, um, this, the, the state does have um, the latitude to require that. Um, a number of you have asked about family caregivers. There are a couple of questions about that. So states are not required to pay family caregivers. States may pay family caregivers. And um, the state defines what a family caregiver is. And in many states, um, there is a reluctance to pay family caregivers. The practice originated with families of medically, children who have medical complex needs. Um, and for many years, that remained the only place, um, but it has expanded. It expanded significantly through the um, uh, epidemic, through the uh, PHE. And now that the provisions in Appendix K are being retired, at least probably by November, six months after the emergency was ended. Um, many states, if states want to continue that practice, they've got to amend their Medicaid waiver to allow that. Not all states are choosing to. Some states may be amending um, how they do it. Uh, but again, it's completely up to the state on whether to do it and how to do it, and even what limits to um, include. But once the state writes its rules, once it determines how it's going to do that, um, I believe um, the failure to adhere to its own rules becomes something that you can either appeal or grieve. Nancy, I wanted to address something, uh, one of the questions that is so topical for right now. Um, I answered it, and then as soon as I answered it, the question went away. <laughs> so I, uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, say it specifically, uh, exactly, but somebody asked, can you uh, request a fair hearing if your service is denied as a result of lack of providers? And uh, this is, you know, happening all over the place. And well, uh, the state, when it signs its agreement and when it signs its waiver, says that it will have what's called network adequacy. Uh, and it will be uh, have a network available to provide the services requested. So in general, you would think of that as like if you had a traumatic brain injury, for example, 
and you required a specialized service and all the uh, you know all that was offered you for you was a service for somebody with an intellectual disability but they didn't have you know specialized brain injury providers then you could say that that network was not adequate regarding the providers um, there have been uh, large class actions for example where uh, the challenge has been okay state you said you would have an adequate network of providers what have you done to ensure this and I was thinking about it when you said the state could choose in a waiver to allow family caregivers that could potentially be an option if the state hasn't tried that and they're denying services for lack of providers you know maybe they should take that step or have they you know tried to uh, incentivize people to go into providers rights um I think you know Elizabeth has been involved in some of these cases but I think you do have some recourse the, the state just can't say sorry we can't provide providers for the level of services we promised you um uh, there's a question that relates specifically to your um, information, uh, Elizabeth Prio, and the question is, if an individual is notified by mail, oh, there are a couple of these, um, are there requirements for how the participant is notified? And is it email? Is it in writing? Is it, how is it done? Um, and the second question is, how the days are tracked? How, the, how is it uh, 10 days from when the notice is dated. So can you speak to those two? I can speak to the fact that the notice has to be in writing. Uh, so in general, that means uh, by mail, but it also has to be in written in a manner that's uh, accessible for uh, individuals. So that's why you get into, uh, uh, you know, language proficiency and things like that. Uh, I also know that um, a state could choose to also provide it via uh, the email. Uh, I think that's just a, a state's choice. Do you have thoughts on that, Elizabeth? Yeah, I mean, typically it is 10 days from the date of the notice, and usually states try to send the notice three days before the actual um, 10 days starts to run. But uh, it also, some states have different requirements or, or variances on um, when the 10 days to request continuing benefits starts to run or not. Um, so it is somewhat state specific, but it should be at the minimum 10 days from the date of the notice. But one uh, of the things I also, oh, go ahead, Elizabeth. No, if you have something else to say on that, go ahead. I just want to, because we're trying to highlight areas for advocacy um, around uh, when you're reviewing a waiver. Uh, one of the ways that you can get around the 10-day requirement if you, is if you could show that the notice did not re meet uh, the requirements. So, for example, if it, you know, didn't specifically tell you why the service was denied, for example, and just, and just cited the statutory citation. Um, so, uh, the reason it's a good point for advocacy is that you might want to have them create like a sample notice letter or some sort of way to, you know, try to prevent these notice issues, um, which could then, you know, affect the time frame. And, and going back to the point about advocacy, when the state is developing that waiver application, they've got to describe how it is they're going to conduct grievance if they have it, dispute resolution if they have it, and how they conduct um, uh, uh, federal hearings and appeals, including, I think, how they give notice. So again, um, to, to get the rules right in your state, the waiver application, uh, when it's under development or under renewal, are, are the best opportunities to affect that. There's a question so, really... Can I ask you, so there's a question I think that's for you, but I wanted to clarify something that uh, somebody made a point about the supports intensity scale yes. that I wanted to flag for people. That it is true that the sports intensity scale, the CIS, um, it, the websites, it's, the CIS is used pretty frequently in IDD programs, um, but the actual creators of the CIS on the website are pretty clear that it's supposed to be like a guide and not a, um, like not a, not a binding decision. 
um, so that even in states that use it for resource allocation, it shouldn't be a binding decision and that there should always be exceptions processes in sort of that kind of budgeting process. And that's true of sort of any like assessment process and um, that relates back to resource allocation. So I did want to flag that. But um, Nancy, I think there's a question here for you about, uh, you know, when states have notices for public comment opportunity, um, and a bunch of comments get submitted, and then it looks like the state doesn't change anything. What should advocates be doing there? What can they be doing when it looks like the the waiver doesn't change in response to public input? Um, so one, our very first webinar was about how to engage, how stakeholders should engage, and um, the um, unlike the federal government, which kind of only does written comments, states do it a lot of different ways and can do it a lot of different ways. And so the um, presenters in that very first webinar gave a whole slew of things that they do, um, in including convene meetings, um, have individual meetings with um, the state agency personnel, uh, possibly meet with legislators. And so again, the state has a lot of latitude. And while one would hope that what you contribute in comments is going to get factored in. It may not. You may be the only commentator that said that, and there aren't a lot of other people who said it. Um, and, and that maybe um, uh, one strategy is for the things that matter the most. Um, stakeholder coalitions get together and advocate for the most important things that they have. So, so uh, all comments uh, generally, I think we can say all comments are looked at and considered whether it's federal or state government. Not all comments um, get turned into policy. Oftentimes, the comments conflict with each other. Everybody's not on the same page. So I would say that if you want your point of view known, um, developing relationships, direct communication, having meetings, working with a coalition, all of those things are important to impress on the state that lots of people think this or the majority of people think this um uh, and jill you look like you're dying to jump in on mute sorry as always i start talking on mute um i actually was looking at a, at a question a, a different question on here mm. um that came from ivy kennedy and um it's, it's a question that asks about um, attendant pay rates um, in different kinds of settings. So I'm, I'm guessing Ivy means consumer directed versus agency directed. Um, and, you know, she says that it looks like um, that attendant pay or caregiver pay or direct care worker pay is higher in uh, environments that resemble institutions versus in more, you know, home based and that may or may not be accurate. I can see why you would come to that conclusion, Ivy. Um, and you mentioned, Ivy, that um, an announcement from September uh, of 2022 said that ACL was awarded three uh, awarded $3.25 million to create a resource center that will improve support to people with disabilities um, so they can live and participate in, the, in their community. Um, I, I think that what you are talking about is our direct care workforce technical assistance center, and that is getting off the ground. And I see that you say, Ivy, that you've reached out to ACL um, multiple times and haven't heard from us. And we are happy to talk with you, Ivy. It's my understanding that you have been in touch with my advisor, Lauren Pereno, and um, we look forward to uh, working with you on your concerns. Um. There's a uh, comment about this 10 day requirement, not appreciating that the postal service isn't what it used to be. Um, and it might be delayed. And so I, I, I'm sure that creates some complications. Um, and you want to clarify something, Nancy. Um, the 10 day requirement is only to request continued benefits. The, re, the general notice to request a hearing uh, the requirement is that an individual must be given a reasonable, a reasonable period to request a hearing. So that would be able to in, take into account, one would hope, the uh, problems with the postal system. Good clarification. Thank you. I see some comments about um, frustration with states saying that they can't do certain things in response to comments or um, 
or just sort of not responding. And I think Nancy covered the not responding thing. But I do think it's fairly common to hear a state say like, oh, we can't do that. And then you can actually go back and look at the 1915C technical guide, which um, is what sort of these presentations are based off both the waiver and the technical guide that goes with it. Um, and see like, oh, the state actually can do things. It's just choosing not to. So I think although the technical guide is a very long document, it is very helpful to understand like what a state could do, um, what are the sort of big picture limitations on what a state can and cannot do. And then also, you know, they're making certain choices, um, right? So if you're really trying to dig in on advocacy, I think the technical guide is super helpful. I, I admit it's long, but you can go through it sort of appendix by appendix, appendix. and figure out what, like okay. sort of as these presentations are going and sort of follow along with your waiver document itself and figure out like, okay, what is the state doing here and what could they do? Um, it can be really helpful to advocacy and just inform your own advocacy about like, okay, the state is actually able to do these things and this is how they could design their waiver versus what the limitations they actually are functioning under. Um, so. I, I agree with Elizabeth. It's important um, when talking to the state to get to those uh, second and third level questions, right? So, you know, the state may say, oh, we, are, we can't do this. And that reason they can't do it may be because they didn't include it, right? On the, off the a la carte menu of things that we could choose, you know, if I didn't choose fries, I can't eat fries, right? So if the state didn't include some of those services that are on the a la carte menu, then they can't include it then. But, they, you know, that is the time to have the secondary conversation and to get to know what they could have chosen. So you can start to advocate for the, those things you think that they could have and should have chosen. So when that time comes up, you have, you know, been very um, vocal about that and gathered advocates to be vocal about that in the meantime, and you can move the needle on getting the things the state said they couldn't have in between. There's an interesting question about denials. And um, I think there's more than one, but um, <laughs> what, what if, so the question is, the realm is, what if it's just not included in your plan? What if you ask for a service and the, and the um, coordinator or the utilization review person just says, I don't think, you need it, but there's no paper with a notice. So I think that's an area in which it's particularly difficult to, when there's just a verbal denial, and this is sort of what we ran into in the Ellis versus Bosch case, because there was both the paper denial about the budget, and then there were verbal denials about um, not being able to access what was called the exceptions process, so trying to get an exception to the budget. Um, and what matters there sometimes is really contemporaneous recording of like what you were told um, and then trying to potentially go to fair hearing based on this sort of verbal denial, right? Like that I was denied this on this day by this person in these circumstances and I want to ask for it and I've been denied the ability to ask for it and that's a denial. Um, so, you know, it's... And this is something that I would really encourage people to, to seek <laughs> legal counsel from their own state about exactly, you know, how that works. But um, there is supposed to be, as Elizabeth Prio discussed earlier, um, notice is supposed to be written. And they shouldn't be using person-centered planning procedures to um, get around notice requirements. So that's sort of why I tried to talk about that North Carolina example, where there's that delicate balance between discouragement and helping a person plan their services, right? A person should be um, able to sort of ask for what they need and, and talk about what fits within the service plan and what fits within what the state has designed as a waiver. But a person shouldn't be discouraged from asking for what they need, and they shouldn't really be told okay, well, that, you're not going to get that, so we're not going to ask for it. Um, that could be a, potentially a due process violation, and it could you can still have the right to fair hearing based on the notice, the, the failure to provide notice, or um, sort of other concerns around that. But yeah, and, and I would we, encourage we, local, we should, local, local we should, advice. We should say that the, the, the waiver services are linked very much to need, demonstrated need. It's not a service I want or it's, it's do I need the service? So you're always going back to do I need the service? There could be a dialogue about what you need and another way to get to what you need. 
Um, so it's the need that must be met with a service or with um, in the in the Medicaid waiver. There's an expectation that individual service plan will include anything, not just waiver funded services, but you know uh, other um, services in the community. For instance, voc rehab instead of supported employment, um, or there may be a um, an employer who is um, eager to um, hire someone and support them so as not to need support employment services. And so but is the need being met? Um, but it's linking what you're asking for, requesting, or what you've been denied to the fact that you need it is important. Well, I've seen some questions, a couple of questions also about good grievance systems. And I think we get that question all the time about like, what well, tells the state that does it well? Um, I'm not sure I know of a state that does a grievance system particularly well, but I would flag a few things about a grievance system that I think are important. So um, when in a grievance system, what you don't want is it to be treated like customer service, right? So I think there was a question earlier about data as well, um, that like, what's the data on grievances and appeals? And there are supposed to be um, data reported from managed care about grievances and appeals, but um, we've seen a lot of managed care entities treat grievances like customer service. So they try to actually like talk people out of them and try to sort of say like, oh, well, we'll let's try to resolve this here. But you really wanna make sure that there is still a record of somebody grieving, right? Even if they try to resolve it, there's some sort of record of a person complaining about what's happening. Um, so that's one thing I think is pretty critical in when you're designing a grievance process. Um, I think that's true in fee for service, but it's just not as um, until the new rules that have been proposed for under the access rules about a complaint system for HC for fee for service go into effect. I think, um, but that's just one thing I wanted to flag that there's this delicate balance there too about customer service versus tracking complaints. Um, and so I, you know, I can't help but call the call attention to, and I'm going to try to put it in um, in uh, the Q and A section here is. Um, CMS has released a new proposed rule. One of the major features in it is requiring states to have a grievance procedure. And they're asking for comments about what CMS should require states to do. I'm sure Elizabeth's got lots, both Elizabeth's have lots of ideas about that. I would strongly encourage people to work with coalitions. CMS doesn't need 100 million comments. They need comments from um, people with, um, you know, letterheads and experience and, and valid background that can say, this is what we think should be in there. There are a number of other things in that access rule, including requiring states to have an electronic incident management system and defining what incidents have to be reported. There's a section about person-centered planning and requirements for that. So um, I'm going to try to insert uh, ACL itself published a blog um, that explains all of these changes. Erin, if you have it handy before I do, um, the link for the blog that includes um, the description of all of those. I have the email with it, but not the, the link to our website, um, so that you can see what those six or seven major sections are and how it is you submit comments. And the comments are all due to CMS by July 3rd. So there's, we have a couple of months. Mm -hmm. There's also um, a, a, um, a piece in there about, um, I noticed a couple people had asked about how much money actually goes to a provider, to the actual care, like the direct care worker. Um, and the access rule has an element about that in there. So for example, if I have a home health agency, um, the suggestion in the access rule, what is stated in the access rule, um, is that 80% um, has to go to the actual direct care worker. 20% can be used for that home health agency for overhead or other sorts of expenses. So that is an important piece. And I just wanted to add, what, add to what Nancy said about grievances, um, uh, regardless of, of the new rule, which is amazing. Um, even right now, a, gri a grievance policy has to make clear that it tells people that a grievance is not a substitute for a fair hearing. Um, and uh, and then in fee-for-service, again, they don't even have to have a grievance procedure. 
So that might be something that you want to push for. Yeah, and I think that I'm seeing several comments or questions about people being sort of pushed towards dispute resolution rather than fair hearing. And I think it it can be common that a state, in the, in the, within a state, people are sort of pushed towards complaining about providers or complaining, using the grievance system to complain about lack of services. But as Elizabeth Prio discussed earlier in the presentation about the right to fair hearing, you know, fair hearing is when a service is denied, terminated, or reduced, or when it's not been made available with reasonable promptness, you can file for a fair hearing. Um, and so that actually covers a lot of situations. Uh, now, whether or not your appeal hearing officer, um, you know, pays attention to all the things they should is a different question, right? But um, if that is the purpose of a fair hearing versus grievances and appeals and, I mean, grievances and dispute resolution. Typically, even under managed care, grievances and dispute resolution should be more about sort of um, dissatisfaction or treatment versus lack of access to services. Um, there's, I mean, there is an area where, you know, if you're having trouble finding the type, the type of provider you want, that could be a grievance. But if you really can't get services, that can often go more through fair hearing. Um, and I will admit that, like, I think there's been a lot of questions or comments in the chat about sort of lack of access to help. And I think Elizabeth Prio, from her NDRN perspective, would probably agree and just correct me if I'm wrong that like, you know, we wish the PNAs were much bigger than they are, but they do have limited federal funding to do work and um, similar with legal services. It's, there's a lot more work that could be done than there is capacity yeah. to do. So we, yeah, we fund the PNAs and also the ombudsman offices. So don't forget them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we put the ombudsman link in either the Q&A section or the chat um, that people can look at. So we're coming to the end of our time here. We've got two minutes left. So uh, we appreciate everyone um, participating. So, so pleased that there's so much engagement, that there's so many people here. I think we had 395 people yep. at, the, at the height or 400, I think I put 402. So I'm really, really pleased to hear that, um, to see so many people participate. We ask you continue to participate in these webinars. Uh, we need to hear from you. We enjoy the interaction in the conversation and we do consider it a conversation. Thrilled to see we had so many questions. I know we didn't get to all of them. I think we got to about 60 or 70%. Uh, we really so. appreciate that. So we're gonna leave a minute to fill out the, um, the webinar satisfaction. If you will do that real quickly, it really helps us for next time. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I want to say that Aaron has posted the ACL blog, which explains the new proposed rule that includes grievance procedures for you all to um, read and digest. And as people are filling out the census, I really want to thank Elizabeth and Elizabeth from oh. NHELP and from DRN. Um, your presentations were really great and your vast experience as advocates, I think, really provided a rich context for these questions. Thank you. And as you filled out, I would like to thank um, Aaron Shea, who coordinates all of these things and makes sure that we are all on top of what needs to be ready for our webinars. And Marcia Gordon, who faithfully <laughs> always <laughs> gets us through making sure the links are working and uh, gets the speakers and panelists ready for the webinars in the moments before you all arrive. We'll keep this open about another minute so people can finish answering their, their uh, questionnaire. And we hope we see you at the next one. Okay, well, I'm going to log off everyone. If you're still answering, I hope you can get that done. And thanks to everyone.
the two Elizabeths. Great work. Thanks. Nancy, great work. Thanks. Okay. Bye, folks. Bye-bye.